The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Today on BCIT Magazine, Coquitlam teachers share their thoughts on job action and the pending strike. Students who have friends collect their U-passes for them may not know they are actually breaking the rules. And BCIT deals with a computer virus that has been causing problems around the world. Hello and welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Allison Tanner. And I'm Robin Batchelor. BC teachers are taking job action across the province. Phase one means teachers will no longer supervise during recess. The teachers are saying the fight is not about a pay increase, but a need for more help in the classroom. Kelsey Davis has the story. A gloomy day to reflect a gloomy mood as teachers at Coquitlam's Roy Stibbs Elementary begin their first day of job action. Stage one means no recess supervision and for some BC kids that means playgrounds will remain unused. I think it's unfortunate that we've gotten to this point but I think that we've kind of been forced to go in this direction only because bargaining and being patient has not gotten us anywhere and I think we need to make a stand. The BC Teachers Federation has asked for a 13.5% pay increase over the next three years. Teacher Christy Nielsen says money isn't the biggest issue. The lack of resources and support. Um, the kids that we have nowadays tend to have a lot more issues and need a lot more help. And when we don't have any support from outside of ourselves in the classroom, it's really a hard job to do. A major point in the dispute has been the right to negotiate class size and composition, something Chan says challenges her on a daily basis. It's hard as a teacher because we know there's the student who's got the extra needs and they do get a lot of focus and we do have meetings geared towards, okay, how do we address this person's individual learning styles? However, when we're addressing those needs, we're also forgetting about the other 20 some odd kids. For now, BC classrooms will run close to business as usual as there has been no timeline given for the escalating job action. The ongoing saga between the teachers and the government could mean children all across the province are losing more than just their recess. Kelsey Davis in Coquitlam for BCIT Magazine. Kelsey has been following up on this story for us now and joins us live from Burnaby. Kelsey, what are the parents thinking about the job action? Well, Robin, a lot of parents that I spoke to this morning didn't even know that job action was happening, which is actually good news because that means that students are re remaining at the status quo. For the parents that did know, they said their biggest concern is whether job action is going to escalate or not. Robin? And of course, we know that the teachers are frustrated. What has the government's response been to the BCTF? Well, the government is pushing for a 10-year contract with a six-year reopening clause. That means in six years they're going to be able to renegotiate. Um, there has been little movement at the bargaining table right now. The BCTF are not sure uh, or they don't not interested in a long-term contract. So right now, if it doesn't change, the next stage is rotating strikes. Robin? Thanks, Kelsey. The world is still recovering from heart bleed. The virus allowed information to bleed out of servers. BCIT had to work quickly to protect the personal information of students and staff. Laura Taylor explains how IT specialists on campus handled the threat. When BCIT faculty and students arrived this week, they were inundated with messages about the Heartbleed virus. If they didn't change their password by Tuesday afternoon, they would find themselves locked out. The virus had students worried they might lose sensitive information that was on BCIT's servers. I paid through the My BCAT website. Um, I link it to my bank account, so I would really prefer that they didn't hack my bank account and take all my money. The IT department says these messages and sign warnings around campus worked, and there were almost no complications from the virus. 
Well, BCIT is really gratified that students, staff, and faculty have been very patient in terms of their reaction to changing their password. Everybody's been pretty much on board. Okay, thank you. Most students knew about the threat. It has affected social media and the CRA website. Most felt the password inconvenience was minor. It's not a big deal. It's just click some links on the my BCIT page. But a few students might still have had problems. If they changed their passwords too early, they still could have been locked out if they didn't change them again after the leak was really fixed. We put out a lot of communication, everything from you know, good old-fashioned posters on the doors right to splash screens so when you logged on you saw the, the information calling for a password change. BCIT's swift response ensured no sensitive data was compromised. <laughs> Students seemed satisfied the leak had been fixed and that this password change would be the last. The fact that they caught it so quickly um, and addressed it really quickly in, in the way that they did, um, I think speaks to the fact that they're on top of it and they're pretty clear on their security settings. BCIT says this was the biggest online privacy threat in its history. While it says the threat has now been eradicated, it's aware there will always be new bugs and viruses on the horizon. Laura Taylor in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. It's no secret BCIT students are busy with their school schedules, so any helping hand is appreciated. However, there's one favor that may put students in a compromising position. As Ria Renouf reports, asking a friend to pick up your UPass is breaking the rules. UPass holders are required to pick up their cards at the end of the month, but many busy students are handing their student IDs to friends to help out. It kind of sucks that it's in the, all the way in the library, so wherever you are on campus you have to go get them from the library, but other than that, it wasn't really too big of an issue. I never encountered any lines up, lines or anything to get it. No, I don't because we're after lunch shift, we have lots of time. And we're coming here like two hours before school starts. So it's pretty easy for us. If my friends are going to the library, I'm going to give them my student card and be like, yo, can you grab it for me? Because it's like just one extra thing you have to do during the day and sometimes you just don't have time. What most students don't realize, however, is this practice actually violates student ID rules. It's an issue BCIT's Dave Pinton says is a common occurrence. We've heard of instances where students at BCIT are actually coming and swiping multiple cards for other people just out of convenience, and if one of them is denied, they're not quite sure which one is, has been denied, so it can lead to a whole host of problems. It's very easy to get to the UPass machines. There are no turnstiles or passwords needed to be inputted. All you have to do is take your student ID, swipe it, and you have your UPass. And I know we don't monitor the machines, so, but I'm pretty sure that we don't, that it's not us, Transit Police, that has any control over the machines or the monitoring of the machines or anything like that. With no clear policing in place, the school and TransLink are relying on students themselves to abide by the rules. If you get the wrong card, there are security measures in there, and of course it can be confiscated, and then you're out the cost of the card. So it's really not a good idea. Transit police also say they're planning to investigate the situation to keep UPass usage fair for all. Rhea Renouf in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, New Westminster is bringing the beach into the city. And kids are stretching for Earth Day and keeping the shoreline clean. The most rewarding thing for me has been the relationships I developed in the program, both with instructors and classmates. My sense of confidence has never, never been higher. I mean, this, this program has offered great opportunities to be in real world, real industry situations, and, and being in those moments and knowing, I can contribute, I can do this. It's exciting to be in this industry and to meet lots of great people and to make amazing friends. BCIT broadcasts and online journalism, realizing your potential. Standby graphics, ready camera one. If you want to experience the fast-paced world of news. Today on BCIT Magazine. Striking. Make magic on a movie set. Frame. And action. Or bring your creative ideas to life. BCIT's hands-on training will get you started. 
BCIT Television and Video Production. Your possibilities start here. Welcome back to the show. Earlier this week, parts of the Lower Mainland were hit by an earthquake. Joining us now is reporter Justin Kwan with a follow-up on that story. Justin, what's the latest update? Well, Robin, the earthquake was recorded as a 6.6 .6 magnitude and happened just off the northern coast of Vancouver Island. It was actually felt as far as Kelowna. And while there are no reports of damage, people did notice buildings and windows shaking. Justin, people are wondering, are there any risks of aftershocks? Well, Robin, the United States Geological Survey says that aftershocks are normal. In this case, there were three of them. They're also saying that um, there are no more risks than normal for any future earthquakes. But people, this does leave people on edge, as many expect the big one to come eventually. Uh, of course, these things are nearly impossible to predict. Back to you. Thanks, Justin. Many Vancouver businesses rely on the Canucks and the NHL to succeed. As my co-anchor Robin Batchelor reports, when the team doesn't make the playoffs, it's a shorter season for more than just hockey players. Oops. Jean-Marc Germain owns Blue Line Sports in the Coquitlam Centre shopping mall. The store primarily sells Vancouver Canucks merchandise, but in recent years, the team isn't doing so well. Being quickly eliminated from the playoffs in back-to-back -back seasons and failing to even make the postseason this year, for a store that lives and dies with the team, that's bad news. And last season's NHL lockout didn't help. So personally, in order to get back on track, I did have to sell my house and my cars and trying to bring business back in so we could pay the people that we owe. In 2011, the Canucks made it all the way to the last game of the Stanley Cup Finals, which translates to hundreds of thousands of dollars in business and an extension of the selling season by two months. A dream come true for retailers. It was insane. People were so happy. We were like, uh, I mean, we ran out of jersey. Reeboks could not supply us with enough jersey. To try and make up for the current lull in business, Germain has put all of the store's Canucks merchandise on sale. But that's still not enough to bring in some fans. This weekend we, had to, we did a 50% off sale. And I, that did bring back some people in. And even at that, people were still 50%, give me 75%, you know. Despite a 50% off sale on all Canucks merchandise, there aren't many customers coming in the store right now. All business owners like Jean-Marc can do is hope that next season is more successful. Robin Batchelor in Coquitlam for BCIT Magazine. Kids gathered at Kitsilano Beach to participate in the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. But it wasn't just about cleaning up for these youngsters. The volunteers were practicing yoga in the park on Earth Day. Francesca Lucia brings us the story. Hi there. Hi. Are you excited about Earth Day? Yeah. Students are heading down to Kitsilano Beach for the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup event for Earth Day. They begin with the relaxing yoga class and then get to work cleaning the shoreline. Leah Weedman and Shay Silverman are excited to participate in the event because they love yoga and Vancouver. They're worried about what the city could look like if people don't keep the planet green. I'm participating in the cleanup because I don't want the animals to get sick from all the garbage and to help Aviva clean it up. Um, I'm participating today because I think it's important to like stop and take a moment and think about why the earth like, is here and what the, the nature gives us and how great it is to live in Vancouver. But the kids here show Earth Day is about more than just cleaning parks and beaches. It's about enjoying nature. They are able to enjoy the community they live in while also giving back to it. So we were so excited to come out, clean up the beach, make sure that the girls were learning about how important it is to take care of the earth and how you can start in your own community. Garbage often washes up along Vancouver beaches and the kids here hope that instead of seeing this while they practice, they get to enjoy this view instead. So while practicing yoga is important for these kids who have come out for the Aviva event today, so is keeping the earth clean. Francesca Lucia in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. New Westminster is bringing the beach to the city. An urban beach is being built at Pier Park with the hope that it brings more visitors and businesses to the growing royal city. 
Chantal Koskitsa visits the future site and brings us the story. Amid the typical truck and train traffic of New Westminster lies the hidden gem of Pier Park, the proposed future home of New Westminster's first urban beach. The prospect of a beach here has many excited, including high-ranking city officials. We're a lucky council, we're a lucky city to have ourselves. We're all in tune to the same thing, and that's the livability of our community. And this is going to be one more little gem that we have that people can come and use. But the idea of urban beaches isn't new. This beach in Paris is just one of many in Europe and the UK. New Westminster's version will offer residents a place to soak up the sun without having to commute into Vancouver. Because of strong currents, boats, and sea life, visitors will have to resist the urge to take the plunge into the Fraser River. Even without swimming, people are excited about the concept. And it's good for the uh, businesses, local businesses in New West. Yeah, so I look forward to it. That'd be great. New Westminster is really changing. It's really changing for the better. I mean, you can just look behind. It's all the construction, and it's going to be kind of like a West End Vancouver thing, Falls Creek area pretty soon. So it's good. It's really good. The plan to turn this park into a sandy beach will cost around $300,000. That includes installing beach umbrellas, a water park, and a possible concession stand. And it's something that people of all ages can enjoy. Bring their children down here, bring their, their uh, parents down here, and be able to share what this amenity is for all of us. And that's on the river. I don't think any place has one like this, and it'll be something special. New Westminster residents and visitors can enjoy this view while sticking their toes in the hot sand this July, when the beach opens just in time for summer. Chantal Kuskitsa in New Westminster for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, how these cute critters go from being adopted to abandoned. And warm water therapy is making a splash in the dog world. I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, it's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. I, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. A defining moment for me was when I finished my first internship and got lots of really great feedback from industry professionals. I would never have imagined I'd be walking into the floors of TSN and thinking, I'm not a student anymore, I'm here to work. I will be starting a job with an investigative news program in Toronto and I'm really excited to see that grow into what will become hopefully my dream job. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, putting you to work. Welcome back to BCIT Magazine. The number of homeless bunnies is on the rise in the Lower Mainland. Many people impulsively buy them as Easter gifts, but when the cute factor wears off, some of those bunnies end up in our local parks. My co-anchor Allison Tanner reports on how a Richmond woman is giving these Easter bunnies a second chance. These bunnies were once household pets. Now, more than 50 of them live in a shelter at the Richmond Auto Mall. Vera is Sorel Sademan's pride and joy. Sademan found her lost near the shelter having been discarded on the side of the highway. She was a dump bunny and um, she was obviously a very, very domesticated bunny. You know, she was very, very happy to see us. I have no idea who would dump a bunny like that. And there she was, dumped on a very busy street to fend for herself. Sademan cares for abandoned rabbits in this shelter. Most of them were impulse purchases or were dumped by their original owners after going through puberty. Just temporarily for two or three months, they'll lose their litter box habits. They'll start grunting and growling and carrying hay around in their mouths and you know, lunging at people and you know, that sort of thing. They get over it. Hundreds of rabbits are being abandoned in parks just like this one. The SPCA and Rabbitat are filling up with homeless Easter bunnies. We have way too many rabbits coming into our custody and basically it's from irresponsible pet ownership. Oh my goodness. People need to own up. If you're dumping your rabbit, you're killing your rabbit. And that's the bottom line. You're not coming out, huh guys? 
Back at Rabbitats, Sademan is concerned more bunnies will appear on her doorstep. After the annual Easter rush, she hopes responsible families will come forward to take some of them home. Allison Tanner in Richmond for BCIT Magazine. Mary Plishka brings her dogs to weekly appointments for a special type of hydrotherapy. The therapy can help treat and prevent injuries and arthritis, a common problem that progresses as dogs age. Zach Singer sat in on a session to see what it's all about. All then, let's get going. Remy is a young pup who swims for enjoyment, but for his older brother Levi, the aches and pains of arthritis are starting to be an everyday experience. A little time and exercise in the warm water can be just what he needs to ease the pain and prevent further issues down the road. Job, it's non-weight bearing exercise, so he gets to really exercise all those muscles without putting any weight on those joints. The swimming keeps him flexible and moving and uh, he just is so happy when we do it. <laughs> A session in the pool lasts about 45 minutes. The therapist gets right into the pool with the dogs to guide them through the session based on their needs. Now this is obviously a fun swim. We do have therapy swims. Levi's here for preventative maintenance, as in he's getting older and mom just wants to make sure that, you know, he ages gracefully and doesn't have too many back end problems to be the golden retriever. And you, what do we, why, why did she bring you? to get rid of your craziness. But it's not just a pool party all the time. For an older dog like Katie, a weekly session keeps her mobile and lifts her spirits. In the beginning when I started this, I thought, wow, is it the swimming that's helping? Is it the floating that's helping? And then I had two dogs that would not swim at all. So we floated those dogs for the whole 30 minutes and the benefits they received were amazing. Depending on the needs of your dog, a session can cost anywhere from $60 to $85, but it's a price many owners are willing to pay for the health of their furry friend. Plishka believes the mental and physical benefits can last anywhere from two days up to two weeks. Zach Singer in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. A local organization is looking for volunteers to help train assistant dogs. These dogs help people with a physical disability or those who are hard of hearing. However, the wait list for one of these dogs is anywhere from two to three years. Emily Lazatin met with one woman whose special helper can't come soon enough. Nicole Whitford was born with cerebral palsy. She relies on skilled dogs to help her with her daily routine. But last fall, she had to retire her Labrador Leroy after 10 years. It's difficult to um, do everyday tasks like pick stuff up off the floor, um, get in and out of my chair, um, oh, open and close the front door, anything that drops. So having a dog is instrumental in everyday life. Nicole is now on a wait list, but she could be waiting for another year. This is the Pacific Assistant Dog Society, or PADS facility. These dogs are in training, but before they get to this stage, they are in foster homes for the first 14 months. You're teaching them good dog behavior and you're subject, subjecting them to sights and sounds out in the world. And if a puppy at eight weeks of, old, eight weeks of age experiences all these different situations, they're going to have a better chance of adapting and being comfortable as a working dog with a client. Tug. That's it. The next step is for the dogs to learn even higher level skills, like opening the fridge and turning lights on and off. These dogs change lives. If you see a client with a working dog, um, the dogs become the arms, legs, ears of the client. You know, they, they become phys physical extensions of the individual. Meanwhile, for Nicole, some days can be a struggle, and she's hoping she won't have to wait long for a skilled dog. I hope pretty close. They don't tell you anything until, um, until they find a, su a suitable dog in training, and then you meet the dog, and then you know, it's a process. The Pacific Assistant Dog Society is expecting more puppy litters to arrive in the summer and fall, which means more volunteers will be needed to raise the puppies for the first 14 months. If you're interested in becoming a puppy raiser, more information can be found on the PADS website. Emily Lazatin in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. This marks the seventh year of International Record Store Day. One local store doesn't need to go out of their way to have a party. They are always celebrating vinyl. Our reporter Montana Cumming finds out what it is about old records that brings people together. 
Okay, so in, in tribute to uh, the passing of uh, Hurricane Carter, who you may have heard Kevin about, Finseth will discuss Boston music with you for hours and even show you some of his favorite tracks on this turntable if you stop by and visit him at work. He has co-owned High Life Records on Commercial Drive for more than 25 of the 32 years it's been around. From the outside, High Life Records seems to be a simple shop. But on the inside, the store is lined wall to wall with vinyl records and CDs. The selection is so diverse, it's hard not to find something that grabs your eye. Some of the records are new releases, but most are old gems that Finseth has found along the way. So how has vinyl stayed relevant even with the invention of the CD and the MP3? If you have a decent system, your sound quality will be much higher. Um, and, uh, but I think what I've, what I've noticed about people that are, you know, digging through the bins and, and kind of actively pursuing these things, they just, it's just more fun. While vinyl does hold merit as a high-quality source of music, some argue that trendiness plays a factor in its popularity. Andrew Booth, a radio broadcasting student at BCIT and longtime collector of records, feels that vinyl has had a helping hand from the hip community to stay relevant. I think that vinyl is popular simply because Polaroid cameras are popular. There's a nostalgia element to it, like it's kind of a hip thing to be into. It's kind of backwards how vinyl has become popular, but I think it's because of more as an accessory than a way of listening to music. Okay. Finseth, however, is positive that indie record stores will always be here as long as music fanatics love music. He always looks forward to seeing his customers, who he knows mostly on a first-name basis. Montana Cumming in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Comments regarding this program, please visit us online at bcit-broadcast.com or bcitbroadcastnews.ca. And that brings us to the end of today's BCIT magazine. I'm Robin Batchelor. And I'm Allison Tanner. Thanks for watching. We leave you now with another glimpse of the Golden Retrievers at their weekly hydrotherapy session.